Welcome back to The Art of Actual Change. I'm your host, Derek Nielsen, former health specialist turned wildlife, conservation, fine art photographer. Through my many travels around the world, I've met some people who are doing some fascinating work outside themselves to make this planet a better place to live. Each episode, I'll be bringing you these people, letting them tell their stories, and hopefully, you'll find inspiration in these stories so that you can go out and make an actual change in your world or the world around you. Welcome back, everyone, to The Art of Actual Change. I have an incredible guest today. We have Gwen Obermeyer. She and I connected, I think, a while back on, it might have been LinkedIn. I was searching for just different guests to have on my podcast, and I came across Gwen. We had a great conversation a while back, and it's somebody for season two that I thought would be a fitting, perfect uh, person to talk to. Gwen has quite an accomplished history in conservation. Uh, she started out getting her bachelor's in international studies and psychology. She went on to get a master's in public administration. She was the director of development for the Nature Conservancy and later on for Tompkins Conservation. Uh, she was the director of engagement for a symphony. Is that correct? Uh, Symphony in the Flint Hills, yes. Okay, yeah, great. And then she is also the co-founder and owner of Ad Estrada Restaurant Group, and she's been doing that for about 10 years, is that correct? Yeah, and that's Ad Astra, yeah. Ad Astra, gotcha. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> Part of the so, Kansas State motto. <laughs> ah, got it. And currently, you are a member, or an adjunct facility member at Park University, is that correct? Yes. Excellent. So, that is all the amazing accomplishments that Gwen has been up to in her career in conservation. And so I wanted to bring her on and have her talk about the economic opportunities for people who are looking to get into conservation as a career. What are the things that she's noticed over time uh, working in this field? And Gwen, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us here today. You're welcome, Derek. Thank you. I feel really lucky to be here with you. Oh, thank you. So what are what's currently going on? What are the projects you're working on now? And where are you in your career as a as a person working in conservation? Of course. Thank you. Um, OK, so a quick a couple of quick updates that sure. are new for me. Um, so I sold the restaurant. Uh, wow. We had a, had a small restaurant. Thank you. Thank you. It was time. Um, yeah. Our, our restaurants in a, in a, was in a, well, our restaurant, <laughs> I still call it our restaurant. Yeah. The restaurant we started um, is in a really small Kansas rural town, but on a scenic byway, it's called Ad Astra Food and Drink. And we were talking about the state motto in Kansas. Um, that part of the state motto means to the stars. So that's why it was chosen for, gotcha. as a name for the restaurant. Um, we were interested in selling. Our business partners were in their second or third retirement. It was time, had it for 10 years, launched yeah. catering off of it. We were ready to, to do that. So we considered listing it before the pandemic. And then when the pandemic hit, we decided to not even put it on the market and get it through that really difficult first year. Um, and as, as COVID then dipped again, and obviously we're now we're in a different phase yeah. of the pandemic. I know. Um, it was time to go ahead and list it again. And we had, we had the right buyer. So we just closed on it. I think it was this November, maybe this October, November and still running and running strong. So it was oh, a, congratulations. It was, yeah. business. it was good. Thank you. Um, so my current projects, I am still in the world of conservation. I'm a senior associate with one of my most amazing mentors. His name's Mark Burgett. Um, he has a consulting, I'm gonna call it a consulting uh, project implementation firm. Um, saying consulting kind of is a misnomer for, for what that group of people yeah. uh, does. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, when we, when we work with either foundations or conservation organizations, business projects, uh, anything around the world, uh, we're there and we're there 100% to, to help implement. It's not, it's not your typical give advice and, and, and stand back a, and watch things yeah. happen, right? That's fascinating. Yeah, because um, I could see that being a, an issue is that you, you give someone all this great advice on how to do something and then they don't do anything of what you said or maybe just a part of it and it's just not enough. It's like, yeah. you have to do the whole thing, yeah. Yeah, and I would say that thread of, of what's successful in that realm and what I've, I think I've learned throughout the different 
uh, I would say the different lines of my career is that it's the relationships that matter the most. Um, everything that that we've been doing together in that world of conservation, no matter where I've worked, whether it was at the Nature Conservancy or Tompkins or volunteering or working at Symphony in the Flint Hills and bringing 7,000 people to a private ranch every wow. year to listen to the Kansas City Symphony for a day and learn about the specialness of the Flint Hills landscape um, is just remarkable. And it's relational. You know, it's yeah. not transactional, it's relational. Yeah. So. So I know um, you had, had touched on my roles in development um, and fundraising in the world and that great fear of, oh, I don't like to ask for money. How does she do it? Why do, I don't wanna ask for money. I don't wanna run a campaign. It's really about, it's re about the relational aspects of that and, and really just matching up people's passion and, and their vision and missions with, with what they care about in the world. And we all know that it does take some investment and commitment and, people with that capacity and inclination tend to make those decisions to make the world a better place. So yeah. that's why it's been fun for me. I love, I love helping businesses grow. I love being an entrepreneur and, and fundraising is just a natural fit for that as well. Yeah. I'm sure through the fundraising, you've met some pretty fascinating people with incredible stories in their own rights. I'm sure. <laughs> I've met great people. And I'll tell you the, some of the best stories are when, um, we're having the biggest challenges, whether that's on, on big rivers in the Amazon or yeah. in the cloud forests of Latin America or here in my backyard on the prairie. You know, sometimes there's an element of, of risk and maybe sometimes a little bit of fear um, yeah. being, being out in the wild. Um, but that's when the magic happens. Yeah. So when did you get started in working in, in the conservation field? Oh when was gosh. your kind of like aha moment of like, wow, this is something I'm interested in. Yeah. So I would say the aha moment happened when I was really young. Um, I okay. spent my, I spent my very early years um, in what we call the Emerald Necklace around Cleveland, Ohio. It's the Rocky River Reservation. And that was right out my, my front door. And wow. so I was one of those kids that would get out at daylight when I could and head down into what we called the valley or the Rocky Rocky River Reservation area. And I didn't come back until, you know, when we got called in when the street lights came on. So, yeah. so that was my childhood. I was in the mud and collecting newts and observing snakes and watching deer <laughs> and all the critters that are out there. And and so that love was always there, the love for nature. And I found my peace and quiet in nature. Um, isn't that amazing? You know, so, so that that just runs deep with me. And yeah. I think with a lot of people. I, think, I, think I really find that more and more as I talk to people who are just passionate about nature is either they had something early on in their childhood that was like a safe place for them or a place for curiosity to grow or just kept them entertained and like would dive deeper into it and gain so much respect for nature by spending time in it. Or it's somebody who had something happen to them and found, you know, kind of like solace in nature where it was just like their peace and only place that they could feel comfort was amongst the trees or around, you know, animals or something. So it's yeah. beautiful that, that that was your upbringing. That's, that was mine as well was, was just getting dirty and plain and stuff <laughs> coming home muddy and as, as can be yeah. and like just doing it all over again. <laughs> yeah. I still do it. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. Like, why not? Why stop? <laughs> so, so what was your yeah, first, oh, yeah. no, I was going to say, what was your first professional like side of things when you decided like, okay, I'm going to do this as a career now. Yeah. I have a funny story. Well, it's not, it wasn't funny at the time, but I went to Bowling Green <laughs> State University for my undergrad, as okay. you mentioned. Um, and I had always wanted to be a freshwater biologist. That was my dream since I was little, in addition to running a cafe and bakery after I went into my first retirement. Yeah. Um, and I uh, started taking really high level biochemistry and biology courses as a freshman at Bowling Green and took one of the most difficult courses I could take. It was the only graded course I had. Um, and received a five hour D in the course. So I went from, you know, this great college prep Catholic school girl grade point average that was through the roof to a 0 0.04 grade point average my freshman year in college. And I was, it really set me back. I mean, talk about learning from failure. I, I dropped out of the 
the study, I turned to psychology, which was also an interest, but not my first interest. Yeah. And international uh, studies, because I, I'm a global person. I love studying and travel and um, just zoom ahead about 20 years or so. I was sitting in the living room with a friend from uh, Fish and Wildlife, from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And he turned to me and he said, you know, I, I studied in Lake Erie. I was with the Ohio State University. I was up near this island and I knew the island he was talking about. I, I bartended there in the summers nice. um, to pay my way for my international sure. <laughs> international experience in school. And I said, you know, Brad, I always wanted to, that's what I thought I would have been doing for my career. I wanted to be in a lab. I wanted to be studying fishes and water creatures and, and be a, a marine biologist, especially in the Great Lakes region. He said, well, what, what stopped you? And I told him, and he was, uh, at this time, he was a biologist for an energy company in the Kansas City area. Um, and now he heads up Kansas Wildlife and Parks here. He's the secretary there. Um, he said to me, you know, I bet I can guess which course you were in and what happened. And so I told him a little bit about it, and he named the professor who weeded me oh. out of my course. And, <laughs> and we had a really deep conversation about women in science at that point. He's like, yeah. you know, if I had a dollar for every time I hear stories like this, that that women during those times were really struggling through through the science courses and just turned away from it instead of being mentored and and treated treated better um, and going through through that course load. So yeah, so they lessons am... learned. I zoomed ahead to uh, I'll, I won't go through all of my career um, up to conservation, but when I applied for the Nature Conservancy, I was approached to lead um, the office in Kansas City, which was split between the Kansas and Missouri programs for the Nature Conservancy. And they were finishing up a capital campaign for the National Park here in Kansas. Um, they hired me into that office. They approached me for that. And, and I, my answer when I was in the interview with one of my favorite Nature Conservancy staff members, who's now retired, his name's Doug Ladd. He's a great botanist. He was in Missouri with us. Um, he turned to me and said, why us? Like, why the Nature Conservancy and why conservation? And I just looked at him and kind of like cheeky said, I can learn everything I ever wanted to learn about marine biology and every other part of nature, biology, ecology, geography, landscapes, and global conservation. And I hope you guys don't give me a five-hour D for for it. So <laughs> and then I ended up marrying a freshwater mussel biologist. So I have plenty. Hey, of yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a great story. Of, uh, studies there. Yeah, it's great. So for those who don't know, what are some of the, the things that the Nature Conservancy focuses on? What are the, what are the projects that they're involved in? Because there are so many things that, uh, an agency or an organization can get involved in? What are the, some of the ones that they focus on in particular that were, you were yeah, drawn to? You know, I mean, my experience with the Conservancy was both local and global. Um, okay. I was brought in as a fundraiser, the first shared fundraiser for the organization between two states. And immediately my question with our regional director at that point and, and others was, okay, how, this is the nature conservancy. This is, this is the giant, right? This is the big, this is the big league of conservation. Can you get me the soil depth maps from Canada down to Mexico? And can we look at this whole region and the middle of the United States and, you know, who's missing from the landscape? The same question that Chris Tompkins asks at Tompkins Conservation. And what do we need to do to have a healthy um, grasslands region? that's that's united states level at least yeah and i think that was kind of like wow she's asking about really huge huge um projects here and for me that is what the conservancy brings they look at everything at this huge landscape scale um to make a global impact you know um whether it's land water um and and now they're focusing really, really critically with uh, Jen Morris's leadership on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think that's huge for the Conservancy to, to be able to take that on as a, a, a mammoth global conservation organization wow. that it is. Yeah. So my focus there when I, when I left um, the local uh, groups here, I was promoted to, to work in um, 
the Caribbean and Latin America at that point. And then our regions kind of split up some of the work and I landed with Latin America, with Central America, South America, and Mexico. And we focused wow. on water security, food security, and smart infrastructure issues in Latin America. Um, and I specifically was on the fundraising side of it. Um, I had a really lofty goal of flipping the, the philanthropy um, ratio because when I started, it was probably about 10% of funds coming from donors outside of the United States and 90% from US donors. And with our public funding leader um, and myself, we were able to change that for the Latin America region. And oh, I, wow. think, I think when I stopped working for the Conservancy, it was more toward a maybe 40% from the US and 60% from multilaterals and Latin American donors. And Wow, and for me that was just huge. That was, I, I think, one of your questions for me. Yeah, was, yeah, absolutely. Um, what are the most rewarding things? Um, yeah, for you and in, in the fundraising realm, and that was one is is that I saw the diverse change happen in the world of philanthropy. Um, with what do you think kind of sparked that? Yeah, I think. Oh, gosh, oh, is it oh, like local I mean, business and people taking more pride in their own space, or is it like what is it that you know? That's interesting. I I hope I'm not speaking for Latin Americans when I say this. Um, sure. For me, and the experience in talking with leaders who are global CEOs in the world, you know, they they come from Latin America, and so they know, absolutely they have the pride for the local place. I can think of a couple of specific donors from Mexico who are CEOs um, or retired CEOs and um, family foundation leads uh, from Mexico. And absolutely that pride is there and it blends the culture, the arts, environment and faith. And, and we were there for, for the conservation leadership with them and they were leaders in the organization. So. To me, it was it was like this is this is this is you, you know, this yeah. is part of your culture and your space, and you're inviting us into it to learn about it. Um, and for me, it was having people from Latin America in charge of the programs all throughout Latin America. I mean, my one of my best friends is Colombian, and yeah. he's still he's a leader in the world of conservation. I call him a brother. Yeah. It's so <laughs> um, and uh, he's with he's with uh, with Audubon now with National Audubon, and he um, he and I helped lead the 160 million dollar effort for water security. Wow! Um, to launch in Latin America, and we did it. And I mean, we obviously had a lot of amazing amazing people to work with on teams to do that. Um, but it was really fun to lead that initiative with him, and to know that that you know, many of the investments were coming from Latin America to support it. Did you, that's, I mean, that's amazing. That's, that's such an accomplishment. I can see why that's something that you're so proud of for sure. <laughs> that is incredible. What were some of the biggest pushbacks that you saw in that sort of that a challenge of, of that, that accomplishment? Like, were there, were there organizations like such as like the oil companies or whomever that were fighting back to do some of the, you know, the fresh water or the water? Yeah, that's interesting. You know, um, did the organization in general? Yeah, the reality is we're working with with huge corporations, right? And yeah. the Nature Conservancy has a great way of staying neutral and yeah. never taking a partisan approach to to conservation or to who needs to be approached to to get the work done. Um, there wasn't. I never experienced pushback from corporates, it was how do we work together to get to the best solution while knowing, you know, there is that aspect of like, okay, what is in it for the corporation? Is it, is it, does it turn into a brand marketing type of campaign or a, you know, cause related marketing campaign? Yeah. We we're very leery of greenwashing. So you had yeah. that push internally, like making sure that we were not greenwashing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but being able to get the investments at that level for what's needed at the global conservation level, yeah, we, we absolutely had to work with corporations. Um, in, in the Nature Conservancy space, staff were sometimes embedded in the corporations to help work on things like the freshwater cycle 
for Coca-Cola. I'll use them as an example because sure. one of my friends worked with them as their lead in conservation to make sure that they were doing what they said they were doing for, for water conservation. Wow. So, yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, it's pretty fun. I mean, it's it, this is not an easy... <laughs> no, there's so many levels of it. Like when I dive into like conservation, it's like, well, what does that even mean? First of all, like, you know, there's like what phase of it, what part of it, like what aspect of it are we talking about? Like, and then, you know, you look into people and say like, well, how can I have a career in that? And that was something that I was going to ask you is like, and even now having this conversation that's a loaded question you could do anything like you could work for a park service you could work for a company like a corporation like coca-cola and work on their strategic you know water usage and recycling of or where they're getting their their materials to make the bottles or you know the cans or whatever so like there's it can go pretty deep so yeah absolutely i mean there are there are initiatives in and i would say the growth areas now with corporations in that realm of truly implementing measures that are sustainable and focused on what is good in the natural resource world right like they know that that they need the natural resources and there are some really cool corporations out there looking for their social impact uh space right yeah that's like yeah that's what i was going to ask is like where what have you seen how have you seen the the conservation space in your career change like as a career side of things like from when you first started with nature conservancy Mm -hmm. like people probably weren't thinking about greenwashing or your pub the 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 corporate's um reputation when it comes to conservation whereas like today in the last few years it's been i i feel is more apparent um, that companies are taking a little bit more of a stance on like their impact on the globe and like as like a badge of honor do you see that as yeah how have you seen it change you know I think I've had a unique I've had unique opportunities right like I I feel very lucky that I got to work for Tompkins Conservation and our our sister corporation is Patagonia right right So, so you have adventurers yeah and and very high type a folks working in a corporation that and family owned, yes, but functioning as a, a brand branded corporation is <laughs> selling things yeah. um, that took really hard, hard line stances on things like climate change and voters' rights. And, and they were bold and they still are bold. And I think other companies are, are sometimes using that as an example of how they can be bolder. Um, all I'd say throughout throughout my conservation career, and I would say just as my whole life experience and knowing what my husband's been through as a scientist, mm-hmm. I, I do think there is more listening going on about conservation, truly um, what is needed to get to conservation solutions. And I hope I'm not being Pollyanna-ish about that. No, no, I don't think but so at all. Some of my best friends have worked in corporations. I mentioned Brad, who works who worked for an energy corporation for many years and now leads wildlife and parks. Or my friend Bert, who worked for Anheuser-Busch for his whole career. And now he's a water conservation consultant. I mean, these yeah. are just brilliant people who have worked throughout their careers in, in a corporate life and who are giving back in the conservation arena. So um, I do think there's more listening. Um, I would say on the challenging side, I am am concerned that it's really easy to show the beauty of everything and to kind of sugarcoat what what a perfect landscape looks like and how the bison are so healthy or what, what the you know, what the mountains look like. We sell the beauty of the landscapes and I will never forget (laughs) working with a really strong, and I mean, you know, as a photographer. Totally, yeah. That's right up, yeah. Right? Yeah. (laughs) The destruction's on the news. Like, yeah. I do think there needs to be a more concerted effort behind the science and showing the truth to people of, of what the scientists are really struggling with. I mean, we see that in this pandemic. Sure. We see it in climate change challenge. When you get 30 scientists in a room, they're not always going to agree. In fact, I don't know if they would ever agree, right? right. Science is experimentation and and the if then and the hypotheses and and the arguments and the research and the peer review. And it's that rigor that 
that keeps me in that in that sphere of trying to get to sound solutions. And I do have I do feel like sometimes we sugarcoat it a little too much that uh, the world is world is beautiful in the grasslands. Well, it is, but there are huge challenges here with invasives and we're worried about climate change, carbon, like that whole complex carbon Super discussion complex. And, yeah. and markets and, and all of that that's taking place. And so I do think it takes, it takes more, maybe more truth telling or more rigor to really get people engaged and understand what's really taking place and how challenging it is. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I, it, I think it's a big uphill battle just to get people to like, listen. And I think people like you and me just getting the message out there, like even your husband's message and like the things that he struggles with and, and just trying to relate the science to people in an understandable and like tangible way that isn't the, the organic chemistry level stuff that, you know, they understand you and I, I, I didn't do well in my chemistry classes either. So do not feel bad. I, I took organic chemistry like three times and said, Nope, I'm switching. Like this is just isn't happening. Right. And so like, com- like trying to be a liaison for the science and then like the common person like us. And like, you know, I mean, I don't mean like just common person, but like the person who can't handle like advanced calculus, like I just can't, but yeah, yeah. trying to be the bridge of like, Hey, the numbers are telling us this. Um, and, and this, and that means this, you know, like if, if we don't do X, then this is Y is going to happen. And you'd prefer Z, trust me. Um, and trying to figure out how to, how to bridge that. And so, um, where, uh, so I've been reading this book. It's, it's called like regeneration in one generation. Have you read that book? No, I haven't. Oh, I'm going to have to send it to you. It is, it is phenomenal. I I don't remember the author's name, but when you mentioned the grasslands and the, and the, and the carbon sink and things like that. Like every time I turn the page, it, well, I meant the beginning of this book, I'm probably only like 40 pages in of this pretty massive book. And what they're doing is going one ecosystem at a time and talking about the importance of it and how it acts as a carbon sink and how if we regenerate these sort of places, it will help out globally. And I mean, he, this, this gentleman has gone through like, um, the mangrove forest to the, the grasslands, to the tidal flats, to the rainforest. And it, it just talks about what, like how they're important and what their role is in awesome. the global health of this planet. And it's, yeah. it's, yeah. No, I would like to read it. I need to, I need to deepen my knowledge in that area. Um, you know, I think it's, again, I think given how complex uh, conservation is in in these different regions, right? Like the totally. the grassland conservation focus here on the deep rooted tall grass prairie is a lot different than the shorter grass eco regions to the west, right? And and you know we, we could talk all day about yeah. grazing practices and fire and how all of this works and what's happening with the tree growth here and actually how much of that is related to carbon here. You know, it's just, wow. it's just amazing. It's like super, we're trying yeah. to keep a treeless landscape basically in the tall grass prairie and and the growth rate is just is just tremendous. Um, so that's just a constant challenge that we have here in, in tall grass prairie conservation. Um, but yeah, that's definitely for the scientists to, to argue, but I, I love, I love that rigor that does happen when you do have the scientists together talking about this and trying to solve um, for the challenges. Where I have like total lack of patience is where you get the big egos on stage and presenting one solution across the planet for something that is just so much more complex um, and you need to rely on the local on the ground conservation science and and experts who know and who have lived this and know what they're doing um, before applying one solution to all landscapes right and so yeah. so that's kind of my like watch watch for the you know following the false prophet kind of thing um, yeah I read about that all the time so. well you'll yeah, love this book because it's so that. it's like as I'm reading it it's just like I, I'm finding more and more out I'm like wow I didn't know that wow I had no clue and it just opens my eyes to the different ecosystems and, and their role for the, the planet. And so, yeah. um, 
where do you currently think the the current state of the planet's health is? Like if you could rate it on like a scale of like one to 10, like one being like paradise and 10 being mm-hmm. like hell, like where would you kind of feel like currently we are at, like on the scale? Oh, that's a hard one. I know it's, uh, yeah. So I personally would rate it at about like a six. That's me. I'm just saying because, and I can give an explanation why, because I think there's so much good that there's possible to like tip it back to more like a five or four, but I feel like we're beyond yeah. five and it's like, well, okay, there's the rate of consumptions mm. and all those sort of things. Like, I'm curious what your take, somebody who's, you know, and you're talking to an optimist too. I know. Who's always, uh, who's always focused on, we could do this. We could find the solution. You know, um, I would probably go for a five. A five. And the reason I say that is I do, I think we've tipped past, like, like I worked in the Amazon and to see, to see on the ground what the tribes are dealing with, um, with the massive destruction of that landscape and losing, I mean, when, when I was working there, we were losing a rate of 10,000 acres per day of forest to just absurdly negligent ranching. Um, and, and then the burning and the destruction and the clear, I mean, it just, when, when I saw that happening to such an important global landscape that impacts the rest of the world when it's destroyed was just gut-wrenching, wow. you know? Um, and my colleagues who are still in the Amazon, I mean, this is what keeps them up at night, right? Um, yeah, I was say, like, how can you see that? And like, so, and then I look at the United States and I look at the light map of the world, and I still watch towers go up and lots of lights and lit buildings in every major city. And now in rural areas, I mean, I, I can go outside and see the Milky Way at night. Um, and that's really rare, right? <laughs> when, here, I was, yeah. when I was down in Texas Hill Country, I was talking with someone from the um, McDonald observatory and he said they're now dealing with light pollution from oil fields on the horizon that are just lit up at night he's like we're starting to get a lot more interference now and just looking toward dark skies initiatives and we're still putting up a lot of lights in rural rural areas in the u.s and it's it's completely lit and so why do you think that is (laughs) like because i I, for example like my parents like (laughs) their their stretch of highway that went past their house for my whole childhood, it was just dark as can be. And the last five years, they've made this continuous light stream down the entire middle for why? Like people have headlamps yeah. on their cars for a reason. It just, I, I don't get it. And so you can't go in the backyard anymore and enjoy like a bonfire. It's like, ah, the, the you know, the, the sun of the night is out right now. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it, that's a hard one, right? Like, I know that that goes beyond conservation. Maybe I know it's just, yeah, it's just this because we can kind of attitude that really, really gets to my heart. Um, look, I wake up every day thinking, oh my gosh, what can I do that's better for the world today? Like, whether it's cheese making with the local farmer yeah. and learning, <laughs> learning some chemistry and math on Mondays, um, or it's, dealing with some important leadership challenges with our youth in in a rural community who want who want a better life for themselves and also to care for for the land and the water um and then it's the indigenous people who 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 rightfully own these lands that we are we're on um and and their descendants are my friends you know it's just it's it's Those are the challenges I like to wake up with every day. And when we deal with things like the light pollution, I just think like that is such an easy one that you would think like have respect, like you can see better at night if you don't have all those lights out. Yeah, all right. (laughs) It's hard to get people to to understand that. Um, So we have a lot of people come visit just to see the stars and just keep thinking, man, they're the same stars in your neighborhood too. We just need to do those. Yeah. I know Chicago has been known as one of the most guilty cities in the United States for that. They have some obscene amount of orange lights that are just, yeah, there's really not a, a reason besides, you know, yeah. So Uh they, the, um, what were so when were you working in the Amazon more? And, and so that time you were just talking about when, 
give me a time frame. Like when was that? When you were seeing the yeah. the depletion of at the rate so, you were seeing? Yeah. So I started working in the Latin America region for the Nature Conservancy in two thousand eight. Okay. Um, and I left the conservancy in. Is that right? 2008, I think. And I was in Latin America for about nine years. So, you know, we did see some progress. At one point, we were able to track about a three year period where the rate of destruction had diminished tremendously. And we we're actually seeing, um, you know, a, a, better, a better rate of reforestation. Um, and work with the tribes on ethno mapping and taking, uh, being able to regain the places that they had lost because basically a lot of the tribes have been pushed out to the river um, while the forest and, and ranching was taking over. Um, yeah. But then, you know, things change, governments change and policies change and, and it, the cycle starts again. Yeah. So, no, they're a great, I, I, the one thing that I was so moved by in the Amazon was the intelligence, the passion, and the cultural importance of the tribes and the leaders, the leaders who could speak, you know, 10 different languages and get up in front of government leaders and speak eloquently about why conservation was important and and why they want to be a part of of the world solution when it comes to climate and water security and food security and yeah it's no, that's amazing. there beautiful it's uh yeah it's so so this was pre kind of what's going on now with the destruction the fires and the plant and all the stuff that's happening so it right yeah. now do you still have friends you said you still have friends working in the region and are you mm -hmm. in contact with them saying like i am just how you, you know, holding up down there <laughs> <laughs> you know i haven't visited for a couple of years obviously i haven't done any international travel for for it's been it's been a while now so about three years um but yeah we stay in touch um yeah there there's right, a they keep hope they keep hope by going birding with with people and and the same leaders that i worked with and and they're the next generation of leaders from from latin america are now working as leaders um in those regions so you know the efforts don't stop the on the ground the work is it continues um, yeah i'm gonna perfect. keep fighting for them as well i'm, I'm hoping to get back there either this year or the next and one of the the very first conservation disasters that I was a part of in a way that I had been to the region prior to their disaster was the 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 Ecuadorian Amazon where the um, the flooded forest I think it's the Sabueno Reserve or I forget the exact name of the reserve but I was down there I think it was two thousand. I want to say six or eight. I get my travel confused these days, but it was one of those dates. And I was on a canoe trip with some tribal leaders through the, the, the rainforest. And it was my first time in the Amazon ever. And I was just absolutely blown away by the biodiversity, the just the kindness of the tribes and their willingness to open up their homes and show me things that I had never seen before. And not all that long after when I returned back home after completing my big trip down there, I read in the newspaper that the oil company that was in the region had a massive oil spill. And now the entire region that I was in was a wasteland of toxic mm -hmm. sludge. And it was just like, it broke my heart so much because I felt so bad for the people there. And um, to hear about what they were going through afterwards, it was just like, that was the probably the only major conservation thing that I'd, I'd seen like the before and I haven't seen the after yet. I'd like to go back and, and see how they're holding up after it's been probably 10 years since the, the oil spill happened. Um, and I don't know all the details, so I don't want to like air them as yeah. fact when I don't yeah. know them for sure, yeah. but it was, it was heartbreaking. And, and that was, I think one of the early things that got me involved in conservation was just like, wow, how could that possibly happen? Was this like paradise turned into something that you couldn't even swim in or, you know, be a part of without burning the skin yeah, and stuff. That's so like, rough. Wow. And I think, I mean, you talk about returning. I think that's so important to the people um, in, in the regions there. I, one of the tribal chiefs that we met with had talked about stories that were captured about their, 
you know, they opened up. It, it's their their spiritual beliefs, their their natural uh, beliefs, their sacred places, their the way that they live, their home, how they care for each other, how they lead. Um, and when people come in and take those stories and then go back out to the world, um, you know, they have cell phones and TVs in the Amazon, and they're watching their story being told. Yeah. Whether you know, it could be through any any channels, media channels. Um, we're all we're all 24 seven access now, right? Yeah. Um, and I'll never forget the tribal leader said to me, you know, we, we trust when you all return and check the story with us. And so it'd be really cool to maybe get the tribal story from them of what took place. How I'd love to, them, yeah. That's... What's going on? What's, what are the positives? What are the challenges? You know, how they're surviving. Yeah, well, that's, that's pretty. Yeah. And we're all connected to that. You know, I think that's the cool global connection. And yeah, that is my one wish. You know, it's like you back to that ranking of like how the planetary health is. You know, I live in a conservation landscape. I could easily walk out and walk up and sit and be alone and be with the bison for weeks on end if I want. So in my world here in tiny little, (laughs) you know, the backyard I'm trying to care for in Kansas yeah it sure seems like a 10 some days yeah. you know but it's that global stress of of thinking that if the Amazon goes down we're all going to be at a <laughs> at a five or quickly lower whether we like it or not and just the natural disasters taking place I mean Boulder County Colorado this last yeah it's been tough to watch the fires one after another after another and it's just like okay what's going on what, what do you think, like, what are the easiest ways people can get involved in, on like a daily or even weekly low level basis of conservation, right? They don't have to be like, work for a board or like spend tons of time. Like, what are some easy go to ways? Because like, what I'm, one of the things I'm trying to do with this podcast is to provide simple things that people can do every day to make a difference, um, but highlight some of the people who are doing amazing things like yourself and like people who've done other <laughs> crazy things like... <laughs> You know, like those things are in- incredible, but not everybody wants to do that or can do that. So what are you think yeah. like, easy go to like, hey, just do this? Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I worked in the environmental movement uh, on simple steps, you know, like things you could things you could do around your home or yeah. in your in your life as a, a base it on the U.S. citizen right now for for this, you know. I, my question was that when I was at the Conservancy and then when I was at Tompkins, it became very crystal clear is <laughs> stop buying crap. <laughs> yes. You know, Yvonne Chouinard taught me really clearly, look, we're all, we're all working at Tompkins. We were hoping to have an in-person meeting. It would be at Patagonia headquarters. Maybe we could get access to the shop and buy a jacket. And his question right back to us without hesitation is, do you need the effing jacket yeah no I have one that's 30 years old that a friend gave me from Patagonia when I couldn't afford a jacket like that and I could just get it repaired you know I just for me it's the buy quality look to your local and buy as local as you can know who makes your things know who makes your food and I think it's more accessible to people than we realize. I mean, I look, this is this is from the city of Overland Park, Kansas. I got to meet the knitter. She used sustainable wool. Like a and shawl wool. or is it a scarf? Yeah, it's a shawl with sleeves yeah, in it really and go pretty. to comfy. And you know, for me it was do like this could be my one piece for the next five to ten years, and then I'll pass it on to a niece or something but it has her name in it. Her name's Lolly. And she's this beautiful woman who just retired from knitting. And she was at a a fiber arts show. I went with my old neighbor from Kansas city, just for fun. It's a city day. I get to go play in the city. It was great. That's the connection that I, I hope people take more steps to make in everything that they are purchasing. And it's not going to happen with a new iPhone, right? Unless unless you know people at Apple right. or yeah. <laughs> no. um, you know, but I think, I think living in this privileged society, we do 
have that decision making power to get to know the people behind the product and that's how I make choices every day and I think that is an easy way for people um, to make choices yeah no that's beautiful I, I think say that's a great that and know that there are like urban food deserts um, and real issues right like I'm, I'm going today to buy flour and sugar for our local food pantry because they're out there are very challenging issues um, but I live in rural America and the people who don't have the means definitely know more where they're where their yeah. um, resources are coming from and I'm kind of like really like and who am I to complain that it's going to cost me maybe 50 cents more for a dozen eggs at my organic local egg producers market than at at the big box store like I think we have major decisions and and purchase power to to make some huge changes there and so I'd say like wake up every day and make those choices very deliberately yeah no I think it's a great answer it's a huge challenge no it is it's a huge challenge and and I'm uh I think what my very first inter- interview I did on on, my, on the art of actual change it was a woman. Uh, her name is Dr. Gabby Wild, and she kind of introduced to me um, this idea of sustainable fashion. I'd never heard of sustainable fashion before, and now this last person, this woman I introduced, uh, Tracy Strandness with Eco Outfitters, uh, Barefoot Eco Outfitters. Sorry, Tracy, <laughs> was that the quality that we spend up front, if we can will make a big difference in our spend over the year. Like if you buy a 10 things that are going to fall apart on you, you're going to throw them out as waste. Yep. You don't know where it came from. You don't know who was paid a living wage to, to make it. Um, you don't know the carbon footprint that it took to bring it most likely from China, Taiwan, you know, uh, Vietnam or India to the United States or any of these countries that are doing major textile stuff. And you wear it for a season and you throw it away. Well, that is such a huge waste and burden that if you would have found somebody local making a quality product with good stitching and it maybe it'll last you a year or 10 years or 20 years or more, right? And so like the, that buying power, if you can do it is, is I find one simple way that people can get involved. Um, I think my only Christmas gift that I asked for this year was a pair of Allbirds tennis shoes because I learned that they were, <laughs> awesome. they were something that was like more eco-friendly than not. And I just want to research about them more. Um, and they're like my favorite pair of shoes because they're just amazingly comfortable. <laughs> but it was like, that was like a conscious decision. Like I could have asked for like a pair of Nikes, but like those... I don't know much about. And I just, you know, yeah. it was something that I want to dive into myself. So that's, that's great. I love that answer. As, what would be yeah. your advice I to, to be on the waste side of it? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I agree. Um, what would be your yeah. advice to a young person coming up into school right now and looking to start a career in conservation? Like if you could talk to yourself way back, like what would be the advice you'd give to that young yeah. person looking to get more oh my involved? Gosh. In- when I was 18, I wish, yeah. When I was 18 and considering my study and wanting to go into study for a career like this, like the, the freshwater biologist I wanted to be. Yeah. I wish I had known to reach out to someone like Brad Loveless. Like th- there was an ichthyologist out there who knew and could guide and mentor me as a young person for what my true passion was. So I'd say whatever your passion is, whatever gets you out of bed in the morning every day, find anyone in that field. And if they're not the right mentor, they will find you someone they're connected to who will link you up and get a get a buddy and go through it with someone else. Because that's where I see the exciting change happening, whether it was in the restaurant and, you know, one of my, one of my goals with the restaurant was grow leadership in the young people. I, I, one of my major intentions there was, I want the manager here or the server or the, the cook or the dishwasher to see that a working business it, that is relying on locally sourced food and composting in the kitchen and recycling the bar is an opportunity to, no matter what your passion is, graphic design, business, food, water, beverage, you know, like any of that, get the passion and then build it for yourself. And we're here for you. And now I see some of those young people in their own businesses. And that is a huge source of pride for me that this isn't about 
just running a restaurant or owning a restaurant. It is about growing the next generation and making sure that that they have the stronghold and the footing to to be successful. And yeah. so, yeah, I would say like reach out or and, and mentors. If, if you're too shy to reach out, talk with your parents or your friends who have who have reached out and who have mentors for them. I wouldn't have made it without my mentors and no. I still have them. They're strong. They think a lot differently than I do. I fight with them. Um, nice. fight, argue, <laughs> argue strongly. Yeah. My favorite boss is a self-proclaimed jerk and he and I are, are very, <laughs> very close <laughs> these days, you know, but he's a brilliant conservationist and he, he knew the vision and he knew the goals and he knew the direction we needed to go. And I have such a deep respect for him. He's, I'm an extrovert. He's an introvert. I mean, he's, he's, I rely on him for everything. Every career decision I make now or life decision, investment decision, whatever I'm thinking, I, I reach out to him first. And wow. so say find that person or, or try to find that person and, and they will find you if, if that energy is out there. Yeah, I agree. I think that and you can do that in, in any phase of life, right? It doesn't have to be like a young person. Like if you're just yeah. trying to get into something and then you're interested in it, like find who's already been in it and ask them like a ton of questions. Like I, I, I remember hearing like way back Kobe Bryant, like reaching out to Michael Jordan and just not cool. leaving him alone and just constantly going and being like, Michael, how you do this? Hey, Michael, what's your angle? Hey, Michael, hey, Michael, to the point where Michael was like, dude, you're killing me. But it was like the, he was like a big brother to him. And, you know, Kobe became one of the best basketball players of all time. And it was, uh, I love that story of like, just the not being afraid to reach out to anyone, even if it is like a Michael Jordan, right? Like, don't be afraid. The worst they're going to say is no, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then you- absolutely. I mean, look, I was sitting in a, in a room, a room, a zoom room, but Yvonne Chenard, Rick Ridgeway. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm among these conservation greats. Chris Tompkins, you know, yeah. it's heady. You're just like, oh, you're like, oh, famous oh, oh. people. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're accessible and those yeah. lessons are there and they want to grow the next generation of leadership. And they're asking all of us to stand up. Um, and I think that's really critical. And I think it's easy to to get a little bit lax and not stand up. It's an easier place to be. I'm one of those people that takes huge adventure risks, which sometimes are wise, sometimes not. Um, you know, I took a motorcycle ride over the Himalayas as a rookie motorcycle rider. Nice. I have great friends in Australia. It's a good know. story, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, there are there are people willing to to be that guide or that mentor or or just a buddy to you someone to bounce bounce the ideas off of or uh, you know come and observe for a day you know you want to yeah. be a scientist pick your favorite scientist and start reaching out yeah i i love it what's what's next for you what is next in the cuz you you told me you're <laughs> you're you're in a different phase of retirement you're build, you're mm-hmm. making cheese with local farmers and and you're I make cheese uh, on you, mondays I am, I think, I think my, one of my projects right now that takes about 30% of my time is working with a group called Prairie and it's spelled with a Y. So P-R-A-I-R-Y. Look it up at prairie.com. Okay. Um, they give back their proceeds. So like the model of Patagonia, they give 1% uh, back to the tall grass prairie. And so that's a, that's a, you know, a third of my time is to grow the foundation for them and I'm directing their wholesale sales, social media and marketing. And it's a family owned group. So it feels like being in with a, a miniature Tompkins, um, but on the business, you know, I'm in the business side now. So yeah. it's fun. Um, that is and the product that they sell is, is produced in the kitchen at Prairie in Little Newton, Kansas. Um, it's a very heavily influenced Mennonite community and they use hundred year old recipes to make their, their provisions and their little bites and cookies. And it is accessible to everyone. And so yeah. that is the healthy communities based on what you're putting into your body and what you're doing in your life in an active lifestyle. And so I'm gonna help grow that. I'll still teach, I teach one course Every semester at Park University, it's mostly military students um, and police from all over the world. Um, and what's the course? Public administration. Okay. So I teach in the School of Public Affairs. That's my 
my master's degree coming into play there. Yeah. And then I'm still, okay, so I'm working with Mark Burgett on his project implementation team. I don't, I haven't picked up a major project with him. Um, we're carrying some over that we were working on with, with Tompkins. Um, so I'm still, I still have that opening and yearning for a global conservation group. So we'll see what happens. Oh, we'll stay tuned. I'm having some discussions with folks, but I'm one of those people that always needs to watch. Like I'm getting advice from one of my best friends who's a, a psychologist. She's like, now remember, <laughs> a normal work week is, like, yes, but all these projects excite me. So yes, that's um, I'm true. also a part of Center for Nature and Leadership. I should mention that. That's the group of women I've been studying with um, as part of their council for the last six months. Um, and that's been really helpful for me as women all over the world go through different transition, career, retirement, new entry level or or transition in the career. So we'll see. And then my mom wants me to write a book. So we'll see. I want you to write a book. You have a lot of great stories. Everything from, you know, working in Central and South America to Himalayan motorcycles. I think it'd be a very interesting story. <laughs> um, good yeah, and I, I need to it. introduce you to my my best photographer friend, uh, Jim Richardson. We, I promised you that. So you did. Yes. Continue. Yes. I will be glad that. to come and, uh, and do some work in, in Kansas and, and wherever, wherever you guys want me to go, I'll, I'll make a point to do it, especially since I can't travel as much international. Um, even though I may be going to see these cute little gorillas at some point mm -hmm. this year. Um, I think most of my travel this year is going to be still local just because of COVID and everything that's going on. Um, I, I was going to kind of wrap things up, but you touched on a, a really interesting topic that I, I think would be an important question to ask was, how do you feel um, women have been, what is the role of like the woman in your field? Like, has it evolved over time? Like you said, like early on, like that there wasn't, they were just kind of like, they pushed you aside as like, you know, you're not smart enough and you didn't get that, like, see you later. They didn't yeah. give an opportunity. So like, do you feel like it's a space that is more open to women in science and conservation, or is there still a lot of work to be done there? I'm going to quote one of uh, someone who I've actually only met online, like in video, um, mm -hmm. who is leading a, a community foundation in San Francisco. I think we need to flip. We, we need to flip the whole thing on its head, um, mm -hmm. meaning there is still a lot of old school, traditional, hierarchical, institutional things that many of us just kind of accept as the, as that's how things are, right? Well, I'm a little, I'm rebellious, so I'm willing to speak out. Um, and so I do think we're on the path to change, but not enough change is happening quick enough. Um, yeah. And actually, one of my friends, I was a, I'm in a leadership group out of Kansas City. Um, it's been I was a in what it's like a, a chamber leadership program called Centurions, and I was in the 2003 class. So I'm getting old, um, but we still meet as a group every couple of weeks and talk with CEOs from all over the world. Um, one of the CEOs who is African American with the MacArthur Foundation came and talked. He's a, I think he's the chief financial officer at MacArthur. He came in and he said, "Look, Gwen, like, have patience. Like, you can't flip this overnight." And my world is like, but "We're only here for maybe 80, 90 years. Like, that's nothing. It's a blip on the screen. We need to flip this." Yeah, yeah. I'm, I want it now. <laughs> so I my level of patience for this is 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 not strong. I do a lot of reading and meditating to try to calm that down and have reasonable conversations. Um, but I absolutely butt up against um, that very strong, like it's the patriarch that knows and it's this hierarchical structure. It's like, no, we're here to be, we're here to be your partners and to, and to help you be successful and we need you to help us be successful too. Yeah. Um, with, with an equal voice. Um, yeah. I think the tribes, I think the tribes get it. I mean, yeah, they have roles. They definitely have like traditional roles, but the the female voice is so strong. And then, you know, just take that into the indigenous realm. And and I'd say more and more and more and more powerful women from indigenous the indigenous world need to need to have the voice and we need yeah. to listen. 
Yeah, well, I'm right. all for that's it. A lot. That's a lot. That's all the time, right? It is, and and I that's why I want to I want to you know when you when you said that and being a, a woman a business leader like yourself who's been involved in conservation for as long as you have, I think it's important to I mean whether or not you realize it, but you're a role model for a lot of people coming oh, into you. the field, and I was just interesting on your perspective on that and how you know just like every other industry, there's definitely room for improvement. And I just spilled water out of my my hand illustrated bison <laughs> mug that my yes. water bottle that my friend made me all over me. So don't don't oh, no, no, drink it's water right. like I do on video. <laughs> I started laughing. <laughs> well, at least the podcast people won't know. The YouTube people will find out, but yeah. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> no, well, I, I really appreciate you taking the time. I'm so grateful for our friendship and to, to be as just a, a big fan of yours and see what you've been doing over the last few years with, with Tompkins Conservation. We didn't know each other earlier in your career, but now I'm, I'm super anxious to see where the rest of your career is going and what you decide to, to come out of semi-retirement for. I'm not sure what the next role will be, like if you'll still consider yourself retired or not, but um, I'm anxious to see what projects you pick up because I know you're going to be a, a huge influence on whatever you decide to take on. So, oh, thank you, Derek. The feeling's mutual. Thank you for for giving a voice to what's happening um, with so many interesting people around the world. I can't wait to to see more of the podcasts and and learn as well. Yeah, it's been a joy. I mean, starting this the Art of Actual Change podcast has been one of the best decisions I've made, not for like a business sense. Like, yes, it's I've been able to network with some really great people and some things have come out, but like just for me as a human being, talking to people that are doing things kind of like I say in the show, like outside themselves to make this planet a better place to live. Those are just people I want to surround myself with. Like, I just love those type of people. And to have conversations on a weekly or biweekly basis with them is just, it's such food for the soul. And I'm just, I like love all of you individually. And you're just, yeah, it's, it's a great community to be a part of. And, and I, it's been a joy. It's a great Thank decision. You. Yeah. So, well, Gwen, I really appreciate your time. I acknowledge you. Thank you so much for coming on and, and spending time with us here. I, I know the audience will, will love the the things that we've talked about and 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 just we'll recap on on the opportunities in conservation that we still all have um you know it's not too late i think it's a six you think it's a five but we can maybe agree that it's somewhere <laughs> really close to there and there's that that gives us hope that there's time to to take an action step before it's, it's too late. And so I'm also an optimist. Um, and, I, and I love that you are too. I, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I didn't think that there was some hope. So, well, yeah. Well, thank you hope so much. Action, right? Thank yes. You. Yes. And, and we'll catch up soon enough, Gwen. Thank you again. Okay. Thanks, Derek.